Welcome back to Simply Pathology. Today we are going to continue with part two of diabetes mellitus. In the previous lecture, we had read in details about the basics of diabetes mellitus, the classification, diagnostic criteria, what are the types, and we had read in details about the pathogenesis of type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus, and also the role of obesity in insulin development, insulin resistance. So, in today's topic of discussion, we are going to continue with the next remaining portions like the clinical features, the acute and the chronic complications of diabetes mellitus, the pathogenesis regarding the same, and we are going to end with the clinical features. So basically the clinical features of diabetes mellitus, if we see, it is characterized by polyphagia, polyuria, and polydipsia. Now this classical triad is seen in patients of type 1 diabetes mellitus mainly. And if it is severe, it is going to lead to the development of diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, insulin deficiency, if you remember that insulin is an anabolic hormone. So deficiency of the insulin hormone is going to lead to a catabolic state, which is going to induce a negative energy balance leading to weight loss and muscle weakness. So let us try to understand the cause of polyphagia, polyuria and polydipsia. So whenever there is an insulin deficiency or insulin resistance, okay, it is leading to spillover of excessive amount of glucose in the blood circulation. Okay. And this excess amount of blood sugar, it cannot be utilized by the adipose tissue, neither can it be utilized by the muscles. So what is happening over here that as insulin is not being able to act, so uh, there is all catabolic action, reverse action of insulin. There is breakdown of fat and excessive release of free fatty acids. Similarly, there is breakdown of muscle proteins, catabolism of mus muscle protein is there and excessive amount of proteins catabolism occurs. Now, what is happening because of the excessive amount of breakdown of adipose tissue and the muscles, it leads to what is called as a polyphagia. It leads to what is called as a polyphagia. Now, this excess amount of fatty acid, it goes into the liver and undergoes fatty acid oxidation, leading to the formation of ketone bodies. And this excess amount of protein is diverted into the liver for gluconeogenesis. <laughs> now, this gluconeogenesis occurs because of an excessive amount of counter-regulatory hormones like glucagon. Now, this gluconeogenesis along with excessive amount of blood sugar levels and also glycogenolysis contributes to hyperglycemia. And because of the excessive fatty acid oxidation, there is also ketoacidosis. Now, this ketoacidosis is going to ultimately cause diabetic coma, whereas this hyperglycemia means excessive amount of blood containing glucose is going to enter the kidney. And as glucose is osmotic in nature, it is going to carry water along with it. And because of that, it is going to cause osmotic diuresis. There will be ketonuria along with glycosuria and excessive amount of glucose along with the water will be lost leading to polyuria very important polyuria and this polyuria is going to lead to intracellular volume depletion which is going to stimulate the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus leading to what is called as a polydipsia okay now ultimately because of severe dehydration it can also lead to what is called as diabetic coma that is hhs hyperosmolar hyperosmotic state okay so this is the basic pathogenesis of why there is polyphagia why there is polydipsia, why there is polyuria. So if the question is asked, why there is polyphagia because of the catabolic state, because of the excessive breakdown of adipose tissue and muscle, why there is uh, your polyuria because of your osmotic diuresis that has occurred because of that there is polyuria why there is polydipsia because of the stimulation of the osmo receptors leading to polydipsia now what are the causes of hyperglycemia in case of diabetes so you have to say the causes are excessive amount of gluconeogenesis excessive blood sugar level and excessive glycogenolysis okay now we have to understand that in cases of insulin deficiency or insulin resistance, the counter-regulatory hormone increases. So you will have an excessive amount of glucagon, norepinephrine growth hormone. And what is responsible for dehydration? Not only the osmotic diuresis, but also the hyperosmolarity. Now coming to the next very important uh, section, that is the complications of diabetes mellitus. Now there are both acute and chronic complications of diabetes mellitus, and it is can be asked as a long answer question. 
So let us first discuss the acute complications of diabetes mellitus. First, we are going to see the first complication that is your diabetic ketoacidosis. So diabetic ketoacidosis, if you see it occurs predominantly in type 1 diabetes mellitus. And most common precipitating factor is failure to take insulin. So the most common precipitating factor is failure to take insulin. Other risk factors like any kind of infection, illness, trauma, drugs, all these can precipitate diabetic ketoacidosis as well. So let us see the mechanism of diabetic ketoacidosis. So especially over here, what is happening? The first important mechanism is there is a reduction in the amount of insulin and excessive amount of glucagon is there. This is going to lead to decreased peripheral glucose utilization with increased gluconeogenesis. That is going to lead to hyperglycemia, the cause of which I have already discussed. And what is the range of glucose level in diabetic ketoacidosis? It is approximately in the range of 250 to 600 milligrams per deciliter. And such high hyperglycemia leads to osmotic diuresis and dehydration. Okay, So this is the first important pathological aspect of diabetic ketoacidosis development. Okay, Very important. Second important thing is when there is an insulin deficiency, Okay, so as we have already known that insulin was a anabolic hormone. So in the deficiency of the insulin, it is going to lead to a catabolic state. In this catabolic state, it is going to stimulate lipoprotein lipase. So there will be breakdown of fat, okay, releasing excessive amount of free fatty acids in the circulation, which goes into the liver, will undergo fatty acid oxidation and will be converted into ketone bodies, which are the most important ketone bodies, beta hydroxy, butyrate acid and acetoacetic acid or acetoacetate. This is responsible for what is called as the ketonemia and ketonuria. Ketonemia means the presence of ketone bodies in blood and urea means presence of the same in the urine. Now, after this, dehydration is going to ensue and this is going to lead to what is called as systemic metabolic ketoacidosis. Okay, Is this very clear? The pathogenesis of diabetic ketoacidosis should be crystal clear to everyone. Okay. Now, what are the clinical features? What are the clinical features of diabetic ketoacidosis? So there is fatigue leading to nausea, vomiting with severe abdominal pain and increased thirst. So very important thing over here that you have to understand. Look for the history of vomiting. Look for the history of severe abdominal pain. This becomes very important. Okay. There is a fruity, there is a fruity breath odor because of exhaled acetone. So you should go for, you should look for any fruity breath odor. And the breathing is quite deep and labored, classically called as Kusumol's type of breathing. Classically, it is called as Kusumol's type of breathing. Okay. Okay. Called as Kusumol's breathing. Now, this leads to depression in the consciousness leading to coma. So, the basic treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis is to give insulin to correct the metabolic acidosis, removing the underlying factors or correcting the underlying factors. Okay. This was the first important uh, uh, acute complication which was seen mainly in type 1 diabetes mellitus, predominantly in type 1. The second very important complication is HHS, that is hyperosmolar hyperosmotic syndrome or state. It occurs more commonly in type 2 diabetes mellitus and the major reason over here is sustained osmotic diuresis. So what happens that when there is a sustained osmotic diuresis, so for example, the patient is an, in an uncontrollable state. So uncontrolled uh, diabetes mellitus is there. So this is going to lead to severe dehydration, especially seen in old diabetic individuals with stroke or infection who are not able to maintain adequate water intake by themselves. Okay, so they are going to develop HHS, which is characterized by hypotension and coma. Now, in these individuals, no sign symptoms of ketoacidosis are there, like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, kusmols, when they are not there. Now, this is diagnosed very late because no sign symptoms of ketoacidosis is there. Therefore, it is diagnosed at a very uh, severe stage of dehydration. Okay, the patient at this stage has a impaired mental status, and the blood sugar levels usually is in the range of 600 to 1200 milligrams per deciliter. Now, ketone production and lipolysis, remember, is inhibited by insulin. Remember, okay. Therefore, ketone bodies are absent over here. Remember, so ketone production and lipolysis is inhibited by insulin because in type 2, you can ask me this question that why, why sir, in type 2 diabetes mellitus, we are not getting ketone bodies. So the answer is very clear. 
see ketone in type 2 diabetes mellitus the amount of insulin is very high in the circulation because of insulin resistance and this excessive amount of insulin inhibits fat breakdown and inhibits ketone body production in type 2 patients therefore the ketone bodies are not present in type 2 diabetes mellitus should be very clear okay the overall mortality rate is approximately around 20% and this is much much more then the mortality caused by diabetic ketoacidosis okay is this very clear to everyone yes okay <coughs> sir if there is a, a insulin resistance uh, so how does the cells uh, that utilize glucose recognize that uh, insulin is present and there is no ketone production no no and... i am talking about insulin in the circulation i am not talking about insulin which is present uh, which is see insulin is present in the circulation what is happening that whatever receptors are present at the level of the cells they are not responding to insulin that is the problem or they are responding at a very lower rate so insulin's function that is there as that is why i told you the clinical sign symptom that you that i have spoken about this is classically present mainly in type 1 diabetes mellitus okay why because over here insulin is not present in the body only but in type 2 diabetes mellitus that is not the case now do you understand this this point now is it clear yes sir but uh, how it connects with uh, low ketone bodies and because i told you see remember that for see just try to understand over here the basic problem that was hap was happening mainly as i was telling you that insulin is basically an anabolic hormone and in type 2 diabetes mellitus it is not that the insulin levels are low in the body the only thing is that the that the, that the cells are not responding to insulin but insulin is functioning at a normal pace or better than as compared to patient in type 1 diabetes mellitus therefore in case of type 2 diabetes mellitus the insulin level is high so it is inhibiting because if the insulin is there in the circulation insulin is high so it doesn't allow excessive ketogenesis okay it doesn't allow excessive ketogenesis so ketoacidosis is not seen in type 2 diabetes mellitus so ketone bodies you will not see okay even fat breakdown is not seen is this point clear now yes sir yes okay. this is very important point mcqs are asked from this point now hypoglycemia now most of the mcqs they are asked from here and most of the people they go wrong about it so always remember the most common acute metabolic complication in all and any types of diabetes including type 1 and 2 the answer will be hypoglycemia the answer will be hypoglycemia is this point clear to everyone okay okay now it occurs because someone has missed a meal or because of excessive physical exertion or because of increased insulin administration it might occur and it is very commonly seen okay so usually the patients will have signs symptoms of hypoglycemia like sweating palpitation confusion tachycardia dizziness and if it persists it might lead to loss of consciousness as well so this is about the acute complications of diabetes mellitus is this very clear to everyone yes can we now move to the chronic complications of diabetes mellitus now the chronic complications it is a favorite question of examiners favorite question favorite for mcq long answer question viva so the one favorite question was pathogenesis of diabetes mellitus which was discussed yesterday and this chronic complication is another very important uh, 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 you know very very important uh, favorite question of examiner so the morbidity morbidity means the problems in diabetes both in type 1 and 2 occurs because of damage in large and medium sized muscular arteries leading to diabetic macrovascular disease and in small vessels leading to diabetic microvascular disease the microvascular disease includes diabetic retinopathy diabetic nephropathy and diabetic neuropathy okay and it occurs because of chronic hyperglycemia so this damage is causing who is causing this damage Uh, the excessive blood glucose level itself is causing this damage how they are causing we will discuss in details so the pathogenesis of chronic complications of diabetes mellitus it is the most neglected portion but the most asked portions in the exam so there are four distinct mechanisms so think when they are asking you to write about the chronic complications of diabetes mellitus and they are giving you 10 marks or 15 marks so you they are expecting that you write the pathogenesis of chronic complications of diabetes mellitus as well so there are four distinct mechanism so what is basically happening i will tell you that glucose is combining with certain 
uh, substances in our body and forming certain harmful precursors which is responsible for end organ damage the most important of such harmful precursors is advanced glycation end products so the first thing that we will see the first mechanism responsible in uh, for the pathogenesis of chronic complication is the formation of advanced glycation end product so what is this advanced glycation end product let us try and understand i will go very slowly so whatever glucose that is there okay intracellular glucose derived dicarbonyl precursors okay so whatever excessive amount of glucose is there in the body okay that excessive amount of glucose okay uh, uh, gives rise to certain dicarbonyl precursors like glyoxyl methyl glyoxyl and 3 deoxy glucosone what they do they have an interaction with certain intra and extra cellular proteins and by means of non enzymatic interaction they give rise to what is called as advanced glycation end product advanced glycation end product is this point very clear okay so this advanced glycation end product it is a very harmful substance and this occurs in cases of chronic hyperglycemia okay certain glucose derived dicarbonyl precursors like glyoxyl methyl glyoxyl and 3 deoxy glucosone is going to combine non enzymatically with your amino group of protein cellular proteins okay is this very clear now this is going to give rise to what is called as advanced glycation end products now this advanced glycation end products that is formed in persons with chronic hyperglycemia they bind with specific receptors called as rage receptor rage and this rage is nothing but receptor for age that is receptor for advanced glycation end product and these receptors are present in the inflammatory cells in the endothelial cells and in the vascular smooth muscles and once these advanced glycation end product is binding with this rage receptor this binding leads to certain steps it leads to release of cytokines and growth factors especially tgf growth factor beta which is going to lead to excessive amount of deposition of basement membrane material plus it is also going to cause the release of vascular endothelial growth factor which is responsible for diabetic retinopathy so this is the first important thing that happens second is it is going to cause the release of reactive oxygen species in the endothelial cells it is also going to increase the procoagulant activity of the endothelial cells and it is going to cause enhanced proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells and synthesis of extracellular matrix so if you think very very clearly what happens in diabetes in the long term complications all the blood vessels are involved so if this is the normal blood vessel what is going to happen because of all these changes okay what is going to happen the lumen of the vessel is going to get small. narrow because of this there is deposition of so many thing there is vascular smooth muscle hyperplasia proliferation the endothelium is becoming procoagulant so because of procoagulant some thrombus might form over here there is a reactive oxygen species generation again that is going to cause damage and it will cause endothelial activation and once endothelial activation occurs you know what will happen okay so this is very very important point to understand now whatever proteins which are cross linked by this that this thing that we have seen over here this cross linking that we have seen between these two products okay this is resisting any kind of enzymatic digestion so this age product that is the advanced glycation product they are resistant to any kind of proteolytic digestion okay and thus it is going to enhance the protein deposition okay they will accumulate okay so they are resistant and as a result they will accumulate in different kinds of organs as amorphous material which i will show you in the later half of the lecture now this advanced glycation end product induced cross linking that we see okay this kind of cross linking uh, uh, can lead to cross linking of certain proteins like collagen so age or advanced glycation end product induced cross linking of collagen type 1 decreases the elasticity in large vessels increasing the shear stress and endothelial injury and thus predispose predisposing to endothelial injury thrombosis and atherosclerosis also they induce cross linking of collagen type 4 which is present in the basement membrane leading to decreased endothelial cell adhesion and increased extra vasation of fluid and this extra vasation of fluid will contain excessive plasma protein which will accumulate inside the vessel wall leading to the thickening and hyalinization of the vessel wall leading to decreased lumen of the vessel wall okay now the age modified 
matrix okay the extracellular matrix which has been modified by age it traps non glycated plasma or interstitial proteins so it is not only limited okay to uh, you know few of the proteins that we see structural proteins but it is also going to involve certain plasma and interstitial proteins for example they will trap ldl in the large vessels accelerating the process of atherosclerosis they will lead to deposition of cholesterol in the intima okay the albumin is going to bind to the glycated uh, basement membrane leading to the thickening so the albumin binds especially in the renal glomerulus so what happens that the age modified matrix okay it is now combining with different kinds of proteins okay non glycated products like they will combine with ldl they will start trapping ldl they will start trapping cholesterol they will start trapping albumin also leading to further thickening of the co corresponding blood vessel is this point very clear this is the first important pathogenesis of chronic complication and the most important that is the formation of advanced glycation end product the second important the second important uh, pathogenic point over here is activation of protein kinase c so calcium mediated activation of protein kinase c as well as diacylglycerol which is a secondary messenger okay so what is going to happen it, uh, uh, there is a classical intracellular hyperglycemia it leads to de novo synthesis of diacylglycerol and that leads to stimulation of protein kinase c which increases certain growth factors like vegf increase that is responsible for diabetic retinopathy tgf beta increase or increase in the amount of plasminogen activator inhibitor 1 thus they will inhibit fibrinolysis and therefore procoagulant state is induced all these factors leads to diabetic microangiopathy so the mechanism that we discussed age as well as activation of protein kinase c both of them are classically responsible for diabetic microangiopathy is this point clear to everyone okay. now third is the oxidative stress and disturbance in the polyol pathways now this question will is a very important question when you are going to read ophthalmology so basically normally the nerves lens kidneys and the blood vessels normally they do not depend on insulin so when there is a persistent hyperglycemia in such kind of tissues there is an increased glucose uptake in these tissues and glucose in these tissues under the effect of aldose reductase converts into sorbitol which is a polyol and this sorbitol is going to convert to fructose by using nadph now remember nadph is now being used in in individual with excessive amount of glucose because excessive glucose is converting into sorbitol yes so what is happening what is happening over here now nadph remember it is a cofactor for production of reduced glutathion okay that is an antioxidant so decreased amount of decreased amount of nadph will lead to an increased susceptibility to reactive oxygen species and always remember because of reduced amount of nadph because excessive amount of nadph will be used so ultimately what is going to happen sorbitol accumulation will occur in the lens which is responsible for cataract formation in diabetic individuals diabetic individuals so this is a very important mcq so the cataract formation in diabetic individuals occurs because of sorbitol accumulation inside the lens is this point clear to everyone okay now next important thing over here is the next important mechanism is hexosamine pathways and generation of fructose 6 phosphate so excessive of amount of blood glucose induces flux of glycolytic intermediates through hexosamine pathways and this can lead to cell damage and oxidative stress so these are the four important mechanism of chronic complications of diabetes mellitus that we have seen most important being the formation of advanced glycation end product okay now we will go to the easier part lighter part that you are going to enjoy that is the morphology so the long term complications you will see it is seen in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus the first morphology we are going to see the pancreas the pancreas is more involved in type 1 diabetes mellitus now what do we see over here there is classically a reduction in the number and the size of the pancreatic islets okay and this is much more common in diabetes mellitus type 1 also because type 1 diabetes mellitus is associated with autoimmune etiology so you will see classical leukocyte infiltration in the islets so there is insulinitis which is far more common in type 1 diabetes mellitus in type 2 diabetes mellitus if you look at the pancreas there is a very subtle reduction in the islet cell mass 
and amyloid deposition within the islets in diabetes mellitus type 2 occurs in and around the capillaries and between the cells and if you see an infant who is born to a diabetic mother okay because of excessive amount of insulin which is uh, uh, because of excessive amount of glucose crossing the placenta the infant will have increased in number and size of the aisles okay in the infants of diabetic mother very important point if you look at this basic dia uh, diagram if you see the pancreatic aisles if you see you will see first very important thing there is a lot of infiltration by which cells what are these cells that have infiltrated neutrophils okay. yes not the neutrophils these are the lymphocytes which have lymphocytes which have gone okay and also if you see over here in the background there is lot of if you see in the background over here and here not that much common but in the background if you see there is deposition of amyloid which is classically seen in congo red staining so amyloid deposition is classical for type 2 diabetes mellitus whereas lymphocyte infiltration is more commonly seen in type 1 diabetes mellitus so we have seen the basic features of okay what we will see in the pancreas now coming to the diabetic macrovascular disease in the bigger vessels what happens it induces endothelial dysfunction so there is an accelerated atherosclerosis taking place in the aorta and the large and medium sized arteries usually atherosclerosis is a age related process but in diabetic individuals it is going to induce an early onset now it is also going to cause myocardial infarction occurs because of atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries and remember this is the most common cause of death in diabetic patients mi now it is also going to cause gangrene in the lower extremities it is 100 times more common in diabetics okay gangrene is 100 times more common in diabetics now hyaline arteriosclerosis now hyaline arteriosclerosis is basically it is a morphological term which is used which it is a descriptive term that we see under the microscope, which I am going to show you. So hyaline arteriosclerosis, which is a vascular lesion associated with hypertension as well. It is more prevalent and more severe in diabetics as compared to non-diabetic. It is not specific for diabetes mellitus. It is mainly seen in hypertension. Basically, it is nothing but it is the amorphous hyaline thickening of the wall of the arterioles. Narrowing of the lumen occurs over here. And basically both the duration of hyperglycemia as well as the amount of blood sugar levels both determines this hyaline arteriosclerotic change. Okay. Now, this is one important diagram that is seen in diabetes mellitus. Now, this is not a, a very specific sign for diabetes. It is actually hyaline arteriosclerosis is seen in hypertension, but the process is accelerated in case of diabetes. So, a severe hyaline arteriosclerosis can be seen. What do I mean by this hyaline arteriosclerosis? So, what do I see over here? Okay, this look over here. This is the lumen of the vessel. And can you see this deposition of hyaline material and see the thickening? So the markedly thickened end efferent arterioles. So you see the normal size of the arterioles. They are so much less as we see up, appreciate over here. But look at this arteriole, how much big it has become. So there is, this is called as hyaline arteriosclerosis. Okay, hyalinization. And this has an amorphous nature, classically amorphous, homogeneous, appearance is there so this is the severe renal hyaline arteriosclerosis okay now we will start with the diabetic microangiopathy now in diabetic microangiopathy there is a diffuse thickening of the basement membrane of the capillaries in the retina skin skeletal muscle in the renal medulla in the glomerulus and in the peripheral nerves now the diabetic capillaries they become more leaky to the plasma proteins than normal which will leak out and then deposit in the vessel zone the first very important exam asked question, diabetic nephropathy. Remember, after myocardial infarction, renal failure is the second most common cause of death in diabetes mellitus after MI. So what are the classical features of diabetic nephropathy that we observe? Let us see. The first important thing is a widespread thickening of the glomerular basement membrane because excessive amount of glomerular basement membrane material is being deposited. Yes. Simultaneously, not only this, the basement membrane of the tubular or the tubules or the tubules in the interstitium of the renal of the kidney you have the kidney tubules so simultaneously the thickness of the basement membrane tubules also increases secondly there is a diffuse mesangial sclerosis that is seen so diffuse in increase in the mesangial matrix which is pass positive but there is no increase in the cell proliferation so again there is an excessive amount of mesangial matrix deposition that is there 
Now, the characteristic change that we see over here, very, very important exam MCQ also. There is a nodular glomerulosclerosis, also called as intercapillary glomerulosclerosis or the classical lesion that we say, Kimmelstiel Wilson lesion or KW lesion that we see. I will show you the diagram. So the mesangial matrix, okay, the mesangial matrix takes the form of nodule. So whatever hyalinization that we were seeing over here, this diffuse mesangial sclerosis now becomes nodular. Then we call it as Kimmelstein Wilson lesion. These are past positive nodules. Now they occur at sites where the mesangial nodules are very close to the capillaries. So usually what happens, the normal mesangium is providing support to the capillaries, but over here, there is a mesangiolysis. And as a result, the border between the mesangium and the capillary, that margin is compromised, leading to capillary microaneurysms because of excessive blood pressure as well. So as the nodules are going to enlarge, they can compress the capillaries and eventually the entire glomerul glomerulus will become obliterated. Very, very important. There are other two associated lesions. Remember the hyaline membrane adherent to the capillary loop. So the hyalinization of the membrane or the hyaline membrane, when they are attached to the capillary loop, we call that as fibrin cap. And the same hyaline membrane when will, is attached to the Bauman's capsule, we are calling it as capsular drop. So remember what is capsular drop? What is fibrin cap? What is KW lesion? These are the classical lesions of diabetes mellitus. Now, remember both the afferent and the efferent arterioles are going to show hyalinosis. Okay. Ultimately, because of all these changes, the kidney will become ischemic, atrophic, and there will be fibrosis. In the long term, the kidney will become small, like a small contracted kidney. Okay. Not only this, these were the two important, as we have discussed about the widespread thickening of the GBM, diffuse mesangial sclerosis, nodular glomerulosclerosis, and KW disease. We have seen after this, not only that, the large renal vessels will undergo renal atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis as seen in other large vessels as well. And ultimately, because the immunity is also less, the patients have pyelonephritis. So acute and chronic inflammation of the kidneys. First, it occurs in the interstitium, then it spreads into the tubules. Okay. Uh, and one special form that is seen uh, uh, like of pyelonephritis seen in diabetic patients, very important MCQ is necrotizing papillitis, that special form of of uh, you know lesion which is seen in diabetic patients okay this is the class uh, this is the first important thing as we can see this is the kidney cortex this is not the glomerulus this, this is the interglomerular uh, interglomerular area okay this is the interglomerular area as we can see over here and these are the tubules as we can see so as you can see over here, the past stain, we can see the classical thickening. Yes, can everyone appreciate the classening, classical thickening? It shows thickening of the tubular basement membrane. Okay, So there's some deposition of basement membrane material. See over here also. The second most important diagram as we can appreciate over here, that what are these lesions? What are these lesions? These nodular lesions? Yes. What are these nodular lesions that we can appreciate over here? Yes. What are these lesions? These are the classical lesions. These are the classical lesions of diabetic nephropathy. That is the Kimmelstein Wilson lesions as we can appreciate over here. Okay. So these are pass positive nodules. These are pass positive nodules and not only the nodular, not only the nodular thickening, but you will, if you see, there is also a diffuse uh, glomerulosclerosis. There is also a diffuse glomerulosclerosis. And in addition, there is nodular glomerulosclerosis also. So there is both a diffuse and nodular diabetic glomerulosclerosis characterized by a diffuse increase in the mesangial matrix as well. These are the past positive nodules. These are the classical lesions of diabetic nephropathy that we see. Is this point clear to everyone? Okay. Next microvascular complication is the diabetic ocular complication. So because of hyperglycemia, there is a lens opacification leading to cataract that we have already seen how it occurs. Excessive intraocular pressure leading to glaucoma. Ultimately, there is an optic nerve damage. And in the retina, there are two types of diabetic retinopathy. One is a pre-proliferative and one is a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. You will be reading about this in detail when you read ophthalmology. But over here, the basic concept in the retina, remember, what is the difference between pre and proliferative? Now, all the changes that you see in the pre-proliferative, they are confined beneath the internal elastic lamina layer of the retina. Plus, there will be microaneurysms and macular edema. 
whereas in proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy the neovascularization or all the changes they are occurring at the disc or elsewhere they breach the internal elastic layer of the retina so whatever changes over here you see it is breaching the internal elastic lamina whereas in the pre proliferative diabetic retinopathy it is not breaching now remember the pre proliferative okay if the ischemic changes continue because of an excessive amount of vegf the pre proliferative can change into proliferative diabetic retinopathy now diabetic neuropathy 50% of diabetics they have peripheral neuropathy and 80% of diabetics who are diabetics for more than 15 years they present with peripheral neuropathies okay now clinical features of diabetes mellitus the mortality and the morbidity occurs because of the long term complications mainly and both the degree and the duration of hyperglycemia is important okay now myocardial infarction renovascular insufficiency cerebrovascular attacks all these are the most common cause of death hypertension is present in 75% of individuals with type 2 diabetes mellitus <coughs> excuse me in diabetics there is an excessive amount of plasminogen activator uh, in inhibitor 1 which i will tell you which inhibits fibrin lysis which is responsible for causing a pro coagulant situation and which is accelerating the process of atherosclerosis as well now diabetic nephropathy okay diabetic nephropathy is present in 30 to 40% patients of diabetes mellitus and remember one thing that this is seen more commonly in type 1 as compared to type 2 but because the prevalence of type 2 diabetes mellitus is more such lesions will be seen to account for more cases in of diabetes mellitus because type 1 diabetic individuals are young and they die soon as compared to type 2 diabetes mellitus so obviously the cases will be more but the incidence of the disease is more in type 1 compared to type 2 now very important the earliest manifestation of diabetic nephropathy is microalbuminuria very important which is defined as the presence of more than 30 and less than 300 mg per, per day of uh, proteins okay it is also associated with increased cardiovascular mortality and morbidity so microalbuminuria is not only the earliest manifestation of diabetic nephropathy but it is also associated with increased cardiovascular mortality and morbidity now remember overt nephropathy to end stage renal disease now before i go over there just first we should understand this if you do not give any treatment to the patient of diabetic individuals then 80% of type 1 diabetes and 20 to 40% of type 2 diabetes mellitus in a span of 10 to 15 years will develop overt nephropathy with macroalbuminuria wherein the amount of protein in urine exceeds more than 300 mg per day okay and this is associated with the development of hypertension <laughs> okay now once the overt nephropathy is developed okay then 75% of type 1 diabetes and 20% of type 2 diabetes with overt nephropathy over a period of 20 years will go towards the end stage renal disease wherein there will be the requirement of dialysis and renal transplant is this very clear how it is how diabetic nephropathy progresses first to overt and then to end stage renal disease now visual impairment blindness cataract glaucoma will be seen around 60 to 80% of the patients okay um, uh, you know they will uh, develop diabetic retinopathy in 15 to 20 years of time the treatment is to give anti angiogenic agent anti vegf agent now diabetic neuropathy will involve both the ans as well as the pns and both the motor and the sensory involvement is there lead leading to a classical glove and stocking deformity the type of neuropathy is very commonly very important distal symmetric polyneuropathy of lower extremity which is affecting both motor and sensory function autonomic nervous system is involved how the bowel bladder dysfunction will be there there will be erectile dysfunction as well diabetic mononeuropathy one group of nerve involved leading to wrist drop or foot drop these individuals also have an increased incidence of skin infection tuberculosis pneumonia pyelonephritis and gangrene why why is so much infection common because of reduction in the neutrophil activity okay so with this we have completed the entire diabetes mellitus okay the most common form of of mellitus that is the type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus we have covered and now we are want to understand some important other types of diabetes that is the monogenic form of diabetes now till now whatever diabetes we have read type 1 and 2 these were actually having uh, multiple causes okay they were having multiple causes so okay so not only not a single gene could could account for type 1 and type 2 so multiple factors were involved be genetic environmental multiple things were involved 
but in monogenic forms of diabetes which is the more uncommon variety monogenic means a single gene is involved for that particular diabetes yes anyone was having a doubt yes tell me sir why is there a decreased neutrophil function uh, decreased neutrophil function probably it is triggered by hyperglycemia okay probably triggered by hyperglycemia or deposition of certain <coughs> products over there okay sir sir and uh, why is there uh, increased hypertension associated with micro yes. uh, with micro see okay. this is just an incident this is just an incident not not think think over here now for example this is your renal vessel and normally the blood has to flow from here so they will flow at a normal pace now for example if the lumen has become narrowed because of deposition so will hypertension not develop correspondingly yes sir this is very simple logic okay okay now the monogenic forms of diabetes first of all it is an uncommon form and it can happen because of two reason the first is because of primary defect in beta cell function and the second is because of gene defects that impair tissue response to insulin now this is very important from mcq point of view most of you will leave this for the exam but mcqs will come from here <clears throat> now the primary defect in the beta cell function it occurs in very less amount of patients in 1 to 2% patient so there is a defect in the beta cell function but the beta cell number is all right there is no loss in the beta cell number and the largest group under this category is modi maturity onset diabetes of young now it resembles type 2 diabetes mellitus in signs symptoms and it occurs in young patients and basically there is a germ line Uh, loss of function mutation in one of the six genes most commonly in the glucokinase gene mutation is there now other mutations are there for example there are mutations in the gene encoding subunits of atp sensitive potassium channels or sometimes there might be mutations in the mitochondrial dna now such individuals with mutation in the mitochondrial dna has maturity uh, induced okay there is a maternity uh, induced diabetes and deafness both of these things are there now this maternity induced diabetes and deafness is having impaired atp synthesis in the beta cells and it is associated with decreased insulin release and such individuals have bilateral sensory neural deafness very very important mcq this and what do they have they have an impaired atp synthesis now there is a now some other mutations can involve because might be involved because of defects in the insulin gene itself now about modi the question that is asked the most common type of modi is modi type 3 out of all the type that i taught yesterday the most common is type 3 which involves mutation in the hnf1 alpha gene okay so this was the first group of monogenic diabetes that is the primary defect in the beta cell function which was associated with modi as a largest group now there are certain gene defects that impair tissue response to insulin okay now over here there is a mutation in the insulin receptor gene so that is basically affecting the receptor synthesis or insulin binding or affecting the receptor tyrosine kinase activity or the receptor enzyme activity whatever be the cause ultimately there is characterized by severe insulin resistance leading to hyperinsulinemia and there will be diabetes and this is what is classically called as a type a insulin resistance very important question now clinically such patients present with hyperpigmentation of the skin called as acanthosis nigricans and females with this insulin resistance they have pcod due to an increased level of androgens one other type of diabetes in this class is lipoatrophic diabetes which is nothing but hyperglycemia accompanied by loss of adipose tissue selectively in the subcutaneous fat okay and this is characterized by insulin resistance diabetes increased triglycerides acantho acanthosis nigricans along with hepatic steatosis so this is lipoatrophic diabetes is this uh, is this uh, clear to everyone the monogenic forms of diabetes mellitus sometimes it might be asked as a short note <coughs> excuse me now diabetes and pregnancy this is another form of diabetes now there are two types of diabetes that can occur in pregnancy one that a diabetic individual was previously diabetic and she got pregnant that is a pre gestational or over diabetes mellitus and one is gestational that means because of pregnancy the person got diabetes okay so this induces a diabetogenic state along with insulin resistance now women who are having pre gestational diabetes they have increased risk of stillbirth and congenital mal malformation of the child whereas in gestational diabetes mellitus okay uh, as well as in uh, uh, in uh, uh, 
pre gestational diabetes mellitus also if they are poorly controlled it leads to large babies 4 kg 4.5 kg babies macrosomia you know why is there macrosomia because excessive amount of glucose has crossed the maternal plus side to the placenta and to the fetal side and the fetus recognizing excessive amount of glucose starts to release excessive amount of insulin and what did i tell you about insulin insulin is a anabolic hormone it is causing growth and differentiation so the child will become it is interdependent embryo yes so this is going to cause macrosomia very very important concept okay all these concept that i am teaching you some of them will be asked via ophthalmology some of them will be asked via gynecology this is one question for obstetric gynecology okay so child in later life if you see they also have an increased risk of obesity and diabetes mellitus again a very important mcq now gestational diabetes mellitus remember they resolve after delivery but these individuals they have an a risk of developing full uh, diabetes mellitus in the next 10 to 20 years okay now the last topic of today's discussion and with this we are going to put an end to this mighty topic that is we need to understand something about the glycated hemoglobin also called as the hba1c now this is nothing but it is formed by non enzymatic combination of glucose with the globin of the hemoglobin now hba1c levels that we do for patient they are reflecting the glycemic control over the past 120 days which is corresponding to the life span of rbc and the target hba1c level in diagnosed diabetic patient should be less than 7% and this glycated hemoglobin it is not only used for diagnosis but it is also used for for monitoring or for glucose control in diabetic patient normally the levels are less than 5.7 pre diabetic the level is 5.7 to 6.4 in diabetic it is more than equal to 6.5 and the target in diabetic is to maintain it at less than 7% with this i have completed in totality diabetes mellitus anyone is having any kind of doubt 